Good morning and welcome to our worship today. It's such a blessing and a privilege to be able to worship with you. Will you please stand with us as we begin singing together? We're going to sing, I am thine, O Lord. It's number 358 in your hymnal, if you'd like to follow along that way. Verses 3 through 6 and 9. Let's read this together. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Psalm 8, 3 through 6 and 9. Oh, my God. 
morning, church. We have been called to come and worship God together. And so how good it is to follow the call of God to know that we are right now in the will of God, to be worshiping together, to be able to unite in our faith in what has happened to us by the forgiveness of our sins through Jesus Christ, by having faith in Him alone. So what a wonderful thing it is to be able to do that. And as we continue to worship together, we want to fellowship together too. So um, before we stand up, uh, if you have any Operation Christmas Child boxes, you can walk on down right now after we uh, stand up and bring them on down here. That'd be a great time to do it. So why don't we stand up and greet one another? We can all make it back to our locations. We're going to read the scriptures together. And our scripture of the month is Philippians 4, 6. As Thanksgiving comes, as this holiday of being thankful for what we have, we want to make sure that we are thankful to God above all things. So why don't we read together Philippians 4, 6. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Philippians 4, 6. You may be seated. Now we have some announcements. Thank you. Thank you. Ugh. What a great day to come and worship the Lord. I love this time of year. Do you guys appreciate those cool, crisp mornings and the sunny, clear afternoons? I, I love this time of, the, time of the year. I want to welcome all of you to our worship service here at Caldwell First Baptist. Uh, we certainly have a pile of boxes up here. That's fun. Uh, I particularly want to welcome our visitors. If you're a first-time visitor, uh, we'd love to have you fill out one of these cards and just let us know you're here. and. And uh, for all of you, if you have a prayer request, jot that on there, leave it in the pew, and those go directly to the pastoral staff so we can, we can pray as you, uh, as you request. Uh, also, if you're a first-time visitor, out in the lobby, 
After the service, we'd love for you to step up to the information booth. We can answer all your questions about Sunday school or the church or whatever. And we also have a, a gift for you. So please uh, take a moment and check that out after the service. Well, tonight is the annual Christmas hymn sing. This is a group that travels around to different churches. They always land here at the end of the end of the season. It will start at 630 and it certainly has a Christmas theme. And it's nice to kick off the holiday season with a old fashioned Christmas hymn sing. So if you'd like to join us tonight at 630, uh, it'll be right here in the sanctuary. And I think there are some refreshments. So uh, men's breakfast. I've announced this the last couple of weeks. It will be next Saturday. It's at 7.30 in the morning, discussing Christian violence from two perspectives, passivism and just war theory. And right now, you may just wonder, I'm not sure how that really connects to me. Well, they're going to get to some nitty-gritty questions. What if you were in a situation where you or your family was threatened? What if you were in an environment or a circumstance where there was violence? How would you respond? On the one hand, we're asked to turn the other cheek, and on the other hand, we're responsible as men to protect our families. So those are the issues. Those are the topics that will be discussed next Saturday morning. And we have a great breakfast. We have two folks who will share those two perspectives and with some times for some questions. And um, we just want to encourage all you men uh, to come and uh, be a part of that. The last couple of mornings that we've got together for other topics have been very challenging and inspirational, so we certainly want to encourage you to come. Uh, yes, this is the morning to dedicate our Christmas child shoe boxes, uh, and we're going to do that in just a little bit. So if you still have forgotten, you've got about five minutes to sneak it up here, or you can drop it off if you forgot it this morning at the church anytime through Wednesday at 3 o'clock. There is a lost and found out by the restrooms here. Uh, if you uh, have lost a coat or if you just need a coat, maybe you can go check that out. I'm, I'm not watching over that. So anyway, um, read your bulletins. There's additional information. And we do have an opportunity um, through Emmanuel's Child to give to children, needy children in Russia. And so I trust that we have our video. Um, for that this morning. Every year at Christmas, there is a great opportunity to reach out to children on the other side of the world with the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ. Each year, there are new children and new families reached in a unique and effective way. This opportunity is the SGA-sponsored Christmas outreach, Emmanuel's Child. Thank you so much to all who have participated year after year. But to anyone new to the program, here is how it works. The connection point is the Emmanuel's Child Bethlehem Star. One star for every child you want to support. Pick up your stars, take them home, and sign the Russian half. Hang the English half on your tree as a reminder to pray for each child who will receive the stars and gifts. Then return the signed stars with a gift of $25 each to pay for special gifts and Bibles to be given to the children. The stars will be sent to churches in mid-November to assure they arrive in time for Christmas. Then during evangelistic services around January 7th, when they celebrate Christmas, each child will receive the star along with the gifts selected by the church and a Russian language children's Bible. The Bible-believing churches in these nations have been effectively using Emmanuel's Child as a tool to reach out to their communities for many years. They have touched thousands of children and their families with the gospel. Last year alone, over 30,000 children were reached through Emmanuel's Child, along with over 13,000 adults. So it continues to be a very effective tool for outreach across Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, and Russian-speaking Central Asia. Thank you for taking part this year. Your involvement can make an eternal difference in the lives of untold thousands of children and their families. Their faces tell the story. Outreach in Russia has become more and more difficult 
over the years. And so this is a wonderful way that we as a church can begin to, uh, from our perspective and from our location, be able to send gifts over there, especially the Word of God, uh, so that they can be able to start reading the Word and be impacted by it. So if you feel uh, like the Lord's uh, tugging at you to go ahead and support that, you'll find in the lobby those stars, and you can go and participate in that. Well, we have here our Samaritan's Purse Operation Christmas Child Boxes. As you can see, there's a lot of them, so thank you so much, everyone, for turning these in. Every one of these boxes represents a child that this is going to. There's going to be a gospel track in there. There's going to be people who are Christians who are delivering them, and there's also going to be the proof that Jesus Christ loves these kids. And so how wonderful that we're going to be sending these. Thank you, everyone, who has brought those along. And um, we're going to make sure they, they get where they're supposed to go. And we want to make sure we also pray over these boxes because we're going to ask that once they leave our presence that the Lord would take them and use them for his glory. Also, uh, Monday was Veterans Day. And it's a day where we remember and honor those who have served in the military. And so I want to make sure we do that as a church. So if you have served in the military in any capacity, would you now stand? We'd like to thank you for your service. Thank you so much for everything you did. And we thank, give thanks for all those who, who aren't here as well who served. And so we want to pray for all those in military service today, as well as our prayers for Operation Christmas Child. Well, this is the time for our offering this morning. And if you're new here this morning, I want to just mention that this is something that we as the family of worshipers participate in. This is our act of worship that we do on a regular basis. And so you don't have to feel any compulsion to give this morning. We're just glad that you're here. But for the rest of us, this is our way that we um, understand that God has given us everything we have and that we want to give towards him and release our funds so that God can use them for his glory. So as we prepare our hearts to do that, would you bow with me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we bow down to you in our hearts this morning. For you are the potter and we are the clay. We ask that you do mold us into the image of Jesus. You have taken us and brought us into your family, and now we pray that you would make us more and more look like your children, that we would do what a child of the king would do, that we would say what a child of the king would say. And Lord, we want to pray for those serving in uniform. We pray for your hand of grace to be over them, that they would seek you, for we know that when people seek you, you can be found. And we pray for their protection and for them to make wise decisions that would honor you. We know that they're put in situations where they have to make life and death decisions, and so we pray that you would give them your wisdom, and that those who follow you would share your wisdom of the gospel of Jesus Christ with everyone they meet. Lord, we also pray for the sick and infirmed among us, that you would provide sustenance and help to meet their needs. We pray that you would guide them to health, and we pray that those who are physically failing would show those around them that though they are outwardly wasting away, inwardly they are being renewed day by day. And the belief that the resurrection of our new bodies is a reality for all of us who are saved by your grace. By their attitude, words, and joy, I pray that they would communicate the true hope that we have in Jesus. Lord, we pray for the other churches in our community. We pray for the churches that uphold your word and the gospel, that they would proclaim it boldly, that you'll protect them from the attacks of the evil one. We pray for them to have unity in the truth. Lord, for those churches that have turned away from the gospel, we pray for revival and your spirit to cause them to repent and turn to Jesus alone for their salvation, that they would glorify their Lord and Savior Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life. And Lord, we pray for these boxes. Lord, we have gathered them. We have um, gathered the items with love and with a desire for change through Jesus Christ in these lives around the world. We think about those kids that are less fortunate and those struggling. And so we pray first that these boxes would be a small token that would point them to Jesus. 
and that it would turn on a light in their hearts that there are people in this world who love them because Jesus loves them. And Lord, we pray that you would um, guide every one of these children that receive these boxes to faith in you. We pray that you would bring Christians in our lives who would be an example of Christ's love and that they would be able to share the gospel. We pray for the workers who are going to deliver these boxes, Lord, that they would be prayerfully moving forward, that they would only do what you lead them to do, and that they'd be ready to give you the message of the gospel at a moment's notice. And so, Lord, we entrust all of these things into your hands, knowing, Lord, that what you do is always good and always just and always right. And to you, we entrust our time today and our lives today. In your name we pray. Amen. We'd like to introduce a new song for you this morning, so we'll do it during offering, and then we get to do it during worship time as well. And this is from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. shepherd I shall not want. In green pastures he makes me lie down. He restores my soul and leads me on for his name, for his great name. Surely goodness Surely mercy right beside me all my days, and I will dwell in your house forever and bless your holy name. You prepare a table right before me in the presence of my enemies though the arrow flies and the terror of night is at my door I'll trust you Lord surely goodness surely mercy right beside me all my days and I will dwell in your house forever and bless your holy name and even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death shadow of death, you are on my side, and even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, and even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, Right beside me 
Children can now be dismissed for Children's Church. Please head straight to the back, and there'll be someone to help take you downstairs and have a lesson from the Word of God. I invite everyone else to open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15. Our text today covers two chapters, Acts 15 and Acts 16. And last week, we read about the Jerusalem Council and the determination that salvation was by grace alone. And today we look at the results of this decision as Paul and Barnabas decide, what shall we do next? So we'll start in verse 36. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark, but Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him, sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, and his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that he, his father, was a Greek. As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in faith, and they increased in numbers daily. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went to, down to Trous. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. When Paul had seen the vision immediately, we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Back in the 1990s, I purchased my first four-wheel drive vehicle. It was an Isuzu Trooper. It was rather old and used up. It had been a Midwestern 4x4, which tells you that because they use salt on the roads throughout the winter, that it was a rust bucket. But I love that old rust bucket, especially when it snowed and everybody else was spinning out into the side and I would just drive on through. Well, after a while, I had this four-wheel drive and, and it started doing a funny thing. When you would start it up, the ignition solenoid would snap because there's an electrical problem with the current and so it would bust it so you couldn't start it anymore. So I would have to go get a new solenoid and then put it in, but then it started doing that on a reoccurring basis. Basically, every time the car was driven for a while, then it would pop the solenoid, it would break it. So I got to a point where I had about three or four of these solenoids and I had broken them apart and re-soldered them together and then I would continually use them on a regular basis. So I told my wife about my awesome plan that you would, every time you had to restart the car when you were out for a drive or you went out to the store, you'd have to pop up the hood and put a new solenoid in there just to get home. She did not think this was a good plan. 
As a matter of fact, one day she was driving the trooper through one of the busiest parts of Chicago, which was Chicago Avenue and Michigan Avenue, the intersection there. And right in the middle of the intersection, it died on her. She tried to restart it, and guess what happened? It died. And in Chicago, they let you know if you're in their way. So they started honking like crazy, and here she is stuck in the middle of this intersection with nothing to do. And so people are getting angrier and angrier and angrier, and then all of a sudden she hears somebody call her and says, hey, Becky. Well, my wife's name is Bethany, and um, it actually ends up being my old roommate in college. And uh, he was from South Korea, and he came up to Bethany, and he said, hey, Becky, can I help you move your car? What's the trouble? And she said, yes, you can. So he got behind and pushed it, and they pushed it out of the way, and they finally got it moved. I tell you that story because probably all of us can relate because you've all probably had a jalopy in your life, right? And jalopies can be frustrating. And I'm sorry to bring back some painful memories. Some people are going, why are you talking about this now, Pastor? I thought I'd, I'd try to forget that era. Some of you still have that era to come, so you have something to look forward to. It's frustrating to have a tool or a vehicle that is intermittent, it's temperamental, and sometimes just quits on you and doesn't work. So imagine what God has to deal with with us. We are intermittent, we are temperamental, and sometimes we just don't work. Not only that, but sometimes we just decide not to work, right? We say, Lord, we feel his calling, and we say, I don't feel up to it today. Lord, I don't feel like serving you today. I, I don't feel like doing this today. Praise be to God. He knows exactly that we're this way, and he loves us anyways, and he still chooses to use us. Isn't that amazing? We can be kind of broken down jalopies at times, and God says, I'm still going to use you. I'm still going to use you as my tool. The name of this sermon today is Drawing a Straight Line with a Crooked Stick. And it doesn't mean that we draw straight lines with a crooked stick. It means that we are the crooked stick, and that God draws straight lines with us. You see, our nature is crooked, and because our nature is crooked, we make crooked decisions. You know the Mother Goose poem that says, there was a crooked man who walked a crooked mile, right? We can't help but walk a crooked mile because we're crooked people. The Bible talks about it a lot. Actually, I looked up the word crooked in the Bible, and it constantly talks about a crooked generation and that that we do crooked things and we have crooked ways. Now, uh, this is helpful to know because what it does tell us positively is that if we are all crooked and we all have crooked ways, then that means every one of us is usable by God. Because there's not someone among us who is uncrooked. We all have something in us that's going to fail God. We all have something in us that's not going to do the right thing. We all have something in us that's, that's not going to be perfect. And, and what God is telling us is, he says, perfection is not the measure of your usefulness. Openness is. If God can use a murderous, adulterous liar like David, right? Then, then he can use you, and I mean King David. So only God can draw a straight line with us, a crooked stick. So what that means is that we need a godly perspective to look at crooked situations. We can assume and know that we're going to be in situations where we wonder, can God actually use me, or can God actually use this situation? And the text today will reveal to us Not only the humanity of Paul and Barnabas, that they didn't always see what God was doing, they didn't always know what the right thing to do was, that God used them anyway, that God drew a straight line with a crooked stick. So we have to have perspective that even though a situation can be seen as difficult or unusable, that God is the God who can use any situation for his glory because he is sovereign over our lives. So let's discuss three crooked sticks that God can use and use in us and use to build his church. All the three of these things we would seek to avoid, but when they happen, God can and will use them, and a perspective will give us hope in every situation. So the first crooked stick is the crooked stick of letting God down. And it's really the story of John Mark. We're introduced again to John Mark in verse 36 and 37 and 38. 
And we are introduced to the situation where Paul says to Barnabas, after they finish their first missionary journey, and the Council of Jerusalem has determined that Gentiles do not need to be circumcised or follow the ceremonial laws that the Jews have to in their own congregations, Paul says, hey, why don't we go back and let's go visit these churches and encourage them? So it's very important to note that as they begin what is called their second missionary journey, that they did not start on that missionary journey as an evangelistic mission. It ended up that way. But they didn't start out that way. They didn't have the perspective and the foresight that God had to be able to do this. They just said, let's go visit these churches where they're already Christians, and we're going to encourage them. And so they think it's a great idea. But then immediately in verse 37, we find out that Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark. Now, John, Mark, went with them on their first journey, but only for the first leg of that journey. And so if we look back at chapter 13, verse 13, we have this what seems like a very simple verse, a very simple situation, but it was anything but for the apostles. Let's take a look at verse 13. It says, while they're on their first missionary journey and they just left the island of Cyprus, now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia, so now they've landed in what's modern-day Turkey, and John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But they went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia. That's it. It's just a statement that as they got to the mainland of what is modern-day Turkey, that John Mark left. That he said, you know what, guys? I'm not up for this missionary trip. I'm going home. And for many of us, we look at that and we say, well, what was the problem? Well, we were never told what the problem was, but we can make some, some suggestions. Uh, we do know that he did not want to continue on the mission that he signed up for. So he signed up to go, and as the apostles were commissioned, John Mark said, I will go with you throughout this journey. The assumption was that he would continue, continue and complete that journey. But he didn't even really get through a whole third of the journey. He just said, by the time they left Cyprus, he says, I'm out of here. Perhaps he foresaw the persecution that was coming. Perhaps he saw that as they went through Cyprus, persecution was mounting. He thought, boy, this is bad enough in Cyprus, but once we get to Turkey, then things are really going to open up. So maybe I don't want to be there when that does. Perhaps he was not up to evangelizing Gentiles. He knew also that the evangelization of Gentiles was ramping up and it was increasing. And perhaps he thought, I don't want to reach the Gentiles. I'm uncomfortable with that. These are not my people. And perhaps he just wimped out, right? We don't know. But for whatever reason, Barnabas knew that John Mark had abandoned them, but also believed that he was still a good follower of Jesus and he should get a second chance. But Paul took another opinion. Verse 38, Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Paul saw John Mark's abandonment as a reason to disqualify him for this ministry. Barnabas was the encourager. We always see him encouraging and lifting other people up. So Barnabas' reaction to John Mark is not surprising. As a matter of fact, he had actually done the same thing with Paul when people didn't want to associate with Paul. He's the one who brought brought him to Jerusalem and said, you guys need to accept this guy. He's a true believer. He's doing the same thing with John Mark, but now it's Paul who's resistant, and he says no, because one of the things we understand about Paul is that when Paul is in ministry, when Paul is evangelizing, he is a warrior. He was about taking on the forces of evil, and he wanted the people around him who would hold the line in the battle. He did not want somebody who was going to cut and run. He didn't feel he could take a man into battle who would cut and run at the first sign of resistance. And I can understand that. This literally happened to me on a short-term missions trip. I was in Mexico. I had taken a group of families. It was a family mission trip. So it had parents and children there. And we went to a seminary in Puebla, Mexico. And we had our week-long project. We were only going to be there for about nine days. And it was a wonderful project. Things were going really well. And one of the teenagers decided that he needed to go to the prom. And so we ended up purchasing a ticket for him about two-thirds of the way through the trip and sent him home, missed the rest of the trip. He had paid all the money to be there in Mexico, and, and people had supported him and prayed for him, and he ended up going back for the prom. Later on, a few weeks later, asked him how the prom went. He said, I should have stayed in Mexico. As a matter of fact, he really regretted that decision. He was doing the mission of the Lord. He was doing the work of the Lord, and it was going swimmingly. It was going wonderfully. 
and he realized that he'd gone back home for a really worldly reason. And, and to this day, he's, he's grown so much in the Lord that he actually just became a pastor in eastern Oregon just a few hours from here. I hope to connect with him soon. But we all knew at the time that he was missing out. Why are you leaving us here? We're, we're, we got all this work to do, and, and we need all the help we can get, and, and you're leaving. And of course, he, he, he made the mistake, but he, he changed, and he's learned from it. But we can all understand that, that, that Paul would feel like, I don't want to take somebody again who would do that. I don't want to take somebody who would bail on us. And when we look at this in our own life, perhaps you too have failed the Lord at some point. Perhaps you have fallen in sin that affected your family or, or perhaps your church. Perhaps you have not finished well in a ministry and you left before you should have. Perhaps you've not treated people well, spouse, parents, kids, friends, and you feel disqualified from serving God. Perhaps you were unfaithful to the Lord. Perhaps you have sin in your life still that you haven't repented of and turned from, and you feel the guilt of it even now as I speak. Perhaps you are cowardice. Perhaps you've run when God has called you to something and you've run the other direction. Perhaps you have a lack of commitment in your life. And you've shown that in various and sundry ways. And perhaps in that experience you have, or maybe when you do, you will have a Barnabas in your life. Perhaps you will have somebody who, when you get to that point where you feel like you have failed God and that you are no longer a use to them, you have a Barnabas who comes to you and says, you are still useful to the Lord. Don't step out of service. Don't walk away from God. Don't put yourself on the bench. We want to put you back in the game. Praise the Lord for those moments, right? Because we know that God can use a crooked stick. And so Barnabas knew that, and so he wanted to use John Mark. You may have had an experience of a Paul in your life when you failed the Lord, and he says, you don't get a second chance, you're done now. And in that case, you may have felt like there was a black spot on your record that couldn't be forgotten or or couldn't be overcome. And the question people always ask about this story is, who was right, Barnabas or Paul? Well, I think they both were. Take a look at verse 39 and 40. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. You see, I actually think that God, in his sovereignty, used this argument over John Mark, where they were actually both right, where Barnabas says he is worth taking, he is good in ministry, and that was right. And Paul said he's not right for my ministry, and he was right. Because if you think about it, Barnabas was going to head to Cyprus, which is actually where John Mark went the first time, so he's familiar with it. It's a place he has been before, and and he was going to do a mission that he had already done. And so it was a wonderful place for Mark to go. But Paul was not headed that way by God's sovereignty. God didn't want Paul to head back to Cyprus. He wanted him to go the opposite direction. And where he was going was going to be exponentially more dangerous and require much more fortitude and stick And so by the grace of God, I believe that God says, no, you know what, Barnabas? Take John Mark with you. He can handle this in his place in his Christian life right now. But Paul, he needs other men who are more equipped for this ministry. And so it was a grace. It was a grace to Paul to have men who would stand with him. It was a grace to Barnabas because Barnabas now had somebody who would stick with him. And John Mark did that exact same thing. So it caused a split in this missionary team. But it was a good situation that God created out of a source of conflict. God had put a man who had failed him in a situation in which he would succeed. And so when we look at this for our own lives, we can look at it from that perspective. God can use you in any situation you're at. But the question is, are you willing to be used in the way that God chooses? Sometimes our failures determines how God will use us. And sometimes that way is not always the way that we expect or want or desire. So the question is, are we willing to be taken to a place in ministry of God because of the life decisions that we have made that glorifies God but isn't the exact same thing we would choose? I know a man who um, became a, a believer as an adult, and he did a complete 180 in his life because he had grown up, his, his father was a, a clinical psychologist, 
and been taught atheism and evolution all of his life. And he believed in Jesus Christ as a married adult, and his life just completely changed. But he had zero context for his belief. He started as an infant believer. He had, he had zero background. And so he came to his pastor, and he said, what should I do to grow in my faith? And the pastor said, I want you to teach Sunday school. What? You want me to teach Sunday school? He says, that's right. I want you to teach the primary kids Sunday school. I want you to teach first graders. And he says, and I want you to teach them because you're at their level. And as you teach them, you're going to learn uh, the basics of the faith, and you're going to teach it to them, and so you're going to be learning the exact same things they're going to be learning. And then when they get into second grade, I want you to go up into second grade with them. And you're going to teach them second grade, and then third grade, and then fourth grade, and then you're going to go all the way through high school. And as they grow in their faith, and as you, as you teach them deeper and deeper truths of the faith, you will grow and increase in those things. And he thought, that's what you want me to do? Is, is teach the first graders and go all the way through and learn? And he did it. He submitted to that. He said, that's where I'm at in my Christian life. That's what I need. It may be not what I preferred, but it's what God has called me to do. And, and talking to him, he said, it's one of the best things he's ever done. He actually walked through those kids for their entire uh, childhood years. And it was an absolute blessing to both groups of people. You know, it's encouraging. Uh, we, before we move on from John Mark, we have to remember this. Though Paul separated from Barnabas because of John Mark, Paul later on came to greatly appreciate John Mark. He changed in his views. Later on, Paul saw the value in John Mark and treated him like a true brother. I just want to read for you 2 Timothy 4.11. And 2 Timothy was written at the end of Paul's life. And this is what he says towards the end of his book. Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful for me for ministry. Isn't that awesome? He says, you know who I really could use right now to help me and benefit me in ministry? Mark. John Mark. Because not only is he a friend, he's useful to me in ministry. So a man that Paul had previously said, he is not useful to me. He says, now I've come to see him as useful. And as we know, John Mark went on to write the book of Mark, which is the book we read previously to the book of Acts. He was actually a scriptural writer inspired by God himself. God can draw a straight line with a crooked stick. The second crooked stick is the crooked stick of broken relationships. Let me read again what happened in verse 39. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, and Paul chose Silas and departed having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra. A lot of people look at this story and they see a tragedy, but I would actually say that we see the sovereignty of God working in this tragedy. You see, Paul and Barnabas had a serious disagreement, and neither one of them would budge over the issue of John Mark. Barnabas believed so heavily in using John Mark that he decided that he was split from Paul over the issue Paul believed so heavily they should not take John Mark that he was willing to split with his good friend and partner in ministry. So the band broke up, and they went their separate ways. And we've seen this happen in the church over and over, have we not? Sometimes people in the church don't see eye to eye. Sometimes it's unclear which of them are right. Sometimes we look at people who don't see eye to eye in the church, and we go, I can see both of your positions. Sometimes you can see the arguments posed by each side. Sometimes it does lead to a breakup. It may be a couple of people in the church like Yodia and Sintichi and Philippians who just couldn't get along in the church. Sometimes it's an entire church split. I don't like to call them church splits. I like to call them hostile church plants. <laughs> and when those things happen, we tend to think, how awful and devastating to the church. And brother and sister, you are right. These are devastating things, but then the next question is, can God use that for his glory? Can God even use our relationship problems and our church problems for his glory? What good can come out of this split? Well, I'll tell you what good came out of this split between Paul and Barnabas is out of one team, there was created two. And they covered twice as much ground as they would have as an individual group. And then Paul added people to his team. So now the, the, the people who are witnessing are now expanding because they decided to split. And it actually was wonderful 
Because not only could they cover twice as much ground, but Barnabas headed to his home island where he knew all the people and the culture, and Paul headed in the opposite direction. Notice, look at verse 41, what it says. It says that Paul headed up through Syria and Cilicia. So now uh, Barnabas gets in a boat and heads to Cyprus, and Paul heads the opposite direction. He heads up north through, Cilicia, through Syria and then through Cilicia into Turkey. And so he actually goes to, in, in chapter 16, verse 1, to Derby, which is the farthest extent that they had gone to the first missionary journey. So Barnabas goes to the first place that they went in their missionary journey, and Paul goes to the last place they had been their missionary journey. And they start from two polar opposite ends and work their way together. And, and so what a wonderful thing. Now they have two groups working on the same ministry. And so not only that, but Paul then decides to get a partner, verse 40, but Paul chose Silas. And, and that's a very simple statement, but what we know of Silas shows us that Silas was actually probably more equipped to do the second missionary journey that Paul was about to embark on than Barnabas was. And I'll tell you why. First of all, Silas was a Jew. Barnabas was a Jew. But it says that Silas was a prophet. And so Silas had an authoritative way of preaching the word of God and speaking for God that would become very handy as they are not only going to go through what is modern-day Turkey, but into Greece, into Europe. Not only that, but Silas was a representative from the Jerusalem council. He was an official representative that could take the letter that said that Gentiles do not have to be circumcised or follow the ceremonial law, and he was official, and so he could actually go with authority. But lastly, unlike Barnabas, Silas was a Roman citizen. And so where Paul was about to go in Gentile lands, this would become exponentially helpful. As a matter of fact, Silas's Roman name is Silvanus, and you'll notice when you read First and Second Thessalonians that at first it talks about Silvanus greets you. A lot of people don't know that's Silas, same person. Silas was equipped to be able to go with Paul to be able to go and to minister in these Gentile lands they're about to head into. Could anyone have known that? Only one. Only God could have known that. So you see, when we see tragic, broken relationships, we have to look for what God is doing in it. So let's say someone left the church in a huff. Maybe God will use them to benefit their new church and maybe wake up that church from, from some kind of a slumber or help people or minister to people in ways that, that they really needed. Maybe a church is split and there's bad blood. But maybe God will move them in this split to a more strategic location to be able to reach people that the church they split from wasn't reaching. You see, God can use these situations that are bad and negative for his glory. We serve a God who can take our brokenness and inability to get along and make something good come out of it. So not every broken relationship is just a tragedy. Sometimes it's a decision that will later glorify the Lord and actually propel his mission into the future. We would never seek these things, but it gives us perspective when they happen. As we try to follow the Lord, we try to do the right thing, and problems happen, we can say even in the problems, God will sovereignly work. Amen? Third, crooked stick. The crooked stick of misunderstanding God's will. This is the story of Paul and his partners finding their way, and, and it's almost humorous, but it, it, it's so typical of, of our lives as we try to understand what God's will is like. And we see here that, that Paul is starting to gather a crack team of amazing ministers, of courageous men who will serve. And so we see here in chapter 16 that they get to Derby and Lystra, and in Lystra there was a disciple named Timothy. You've heard that name before, right? Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman, who was a believer, and his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and even Iconium, which makes me think that, that maybe they, he traveled there and maybe he even did some preaching and teaching, and so he was sort of an itinerant guy. And so they thought, man, this guy is a follower of Jesus. He's a faithful servant. Paul, you should take him with you. And Paul said, I'd love to. And so we begin to see that with Silas and Timothy, they're creating this wonderful team. And, and as you may have noticed, that when they talk about the Macedonian call for the very first time, it says uh, in chapter 10, and when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia. That's the first time we hear the word we, and that means that Luke has now joined the team. So we have Silas, we have Timothy, and we have Luke all joining this team. And it reminds me of one of my favorite Western movies, The Magnificent Seven. And a third of that movie is just gathering this team of seven gunfighters that are going to take on like a hundred of these thugs. And you just love it because they're getting one good guy after the other. Yes, 
Yes, that's the right guy. Yes, and you just love this. And so the team is being built. They're being brought together to go fight for the Lord. And so Paul does an interesting thing in verse 3. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him, and he circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. What's going on here? Just the previous chapter, the Jewish council, the Jerusalem council, decided that the Gentiles did not need to be circumcised in order to be justified, that that was unnecessary. And yet, Paul takes a half-Greek, half-Jewish man and circumcises him. What is happening here? Well, there's some things about Jewish culture we need to understand. One is, the Jewish law stated that when a Jewish woman married a Gentile man, the marriage wasn't actually officially recognized by the Jewish people. So the boy's lineage came from his mother. It was maternal. And so because his lineage came from his mother, he was considered fully Jewish, even though he was only half. And so whenever they would go around on their missionary journey, it says that they all knew that his father was Greek, but they all knew that his mother was Jewish, and so they, they were always going to be looking at him and saying, who do you associate with? Who do you identify with? Have you embraced your Jewishness because that is what you are? And if you believe in Jesus and you have not embraced the fact that you're Jewish, then how can we take you seriously and see you as a legitimate proclaimer of the Jewish Messiah? In other words, how could a man they would be considered Jewish who was uncircumcised, who hasn't even taken the basic sign of the covenant, be one who proclaims the Jewish Messiah? He would be considered a turncoat. He would be considered somebody who turned away from his beliefs. Many of you remember the commercials back in the day for Verizon Wireless with the guy who said, can you hear me now, right? It became this really annoying fad. People started saying all the time, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? I still say that when the, when the phone goes out and people are going, really, you're going to keep saying that? I'm like, I just can't hear you, really. But you, you may have noticed that he's changed signs, right? And this guy is doing the commercials now, not for Ver, Verizon, uh, but Sprint. And he says, I used to work for Ver, Verizon, but now I work for Sprint, and they're much better. And we all know the truth, that that guy got some, he needed some money, and so he started, he, right? So he started working for Sprint, and now he's just turned on them. It's not because one's better than the other, it's just because he's got, he needs some cash. So we know he's just a turncoat, right? He did it for the money. So he loses his credibility, and this is what Timothy would be dealing with, is saying, if you're not willing to be associated with the Jews, how can you proclaim the Jewish Messiah? So Paul circumcises Timothy, not for justification, but for authentication. Did you get that? Timothy needed to be authenticated that he had embraced his Jewish heritage so he could speak to Jewish people. Now, there's a principle here I don't want us to miss. That when, when you're in a group of people who are believing the right things about the word of God, that when they have something that they believe, that you should consider taking that on, even though you may struggle with that belief, because it authenticates your true faith. And the one thing that, that, that we struggle with is the issue of baptism. Baptism is very similar to this. And there's a principle here that we can take that, that, that there are two real reasons for baptism. The first reason is we do it because Jesus commanded it of all people who become believers in Jesus Christ. But the second reason we, we are baptized is because it authenticates the fact that we're a Christian in the body with which we serve and with which we have joined ourselves. And there are all kinds of traditions about baptism out there. There is a tradition with, amongst the Quakers that there, there is no such thing as physical baptism. There's, there are traditions of infant baptism. And so when people come here to our church, they wonder, what should I do? And I think that there's a direction and a principle here that we can all look at and say, when people are proposing to us a biblical concept that, that you know, it's not, a, it's not a, a essential for salvation, we know that baptism is not essential for salvation. But when they're proclaiming something that we can see as biblical and we want to put ourselves under the authority of the church, and they ask us to do it because it authenticates our profession, and we need to consider doing it for that very purpose, that that actually becomes the reason that we do it. I know a lady who grew up a Quaker, and she wasn't baptized, and then she ended up 
being a member of a Presbyterian church, and then so they baptize her as an adult with sprinkling with the, in a Catholic font. And then later on, she joined the Baptist, and then she was baptized by immersion. And it was this principle that she used to say, I am placing myself under the authority of that church, and their arguments are biblical, and this is a sign of my authentication of my faith, my true association with the people of God, and therefore I'm going to do it. So we see a really interesting principle here that Timothy is ready to be circumcised to authenticate his true faith because he knows that when you're Jewish and you believe in Jesus Christ, you can be circumcised because you're physically circumcised which points to the circumcision of your heart. It's a wonderful combination. So then we move on and there's a misunderstanding of God's will. Verse 6, they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia and been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. Imagine what was happening here. Paul was on graph paper. His mission had ended. He actually had gone to all the old churches that they had started, and he had encouraged them. It says in verse 5, the churches were strengthened in faith, and they increased in numbers daily. And that verse is to be an ending point, to say they had finished their, their goal. And so Paul's on graph paper, and he says, hey, while we're out here, Let's go start some new churches. Let's go to some places that have previously been unreached because we know from 1 Corinthians, Paul always wants to go and build his own foundation. He doesn't want to build on someone else's foundation. And so he wants to go, but all of a sudden there's a problem. He wants to go to Asia Minor, which is west of where he was, and hopefully get to the city of Ephesus, which is the major city of that area, and the Holy Spirit forbid it. The Holy Spirit said, no, you can't go there. Okay, so then he decides, I can't go west, so I'm going to head north, and I'm going to try to get to Bithynia. And so he heads up north, but the Spirit didn't allow him. By the way, it's the Spirit of Jesus. We know that the Spirit is Jesus' Spirit, who he has sent to guide us, and, and so he is leading us, and the Spirit said no. Well, what, what was happening here? Well, we know, that, we know that through the Spirit, God speaks to Paul audibly. God speaks to him in visions. God speaks to him in dreams. It could have been any combination of those things, but God supernaturally let him know, oh, you can't go that way. Okay, so Paul decides, I'm going to head this way. Uh, No, you can't go that way. And so when you look at the map, what it ends up being is this northwesterly trip that they had all the way through Turkey, not actually hitting any cities, and going through and and avoiding all of the major places of population, and it says that they end up in Troas. Verse Eight. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. And Troas is, is the end of the line. They get, they, this is a port city. They're here at the ocean. And so there's a wonderful picture here that when you don't know God's will, when you're trying to figure out where he is leading you, just keep moving forward. Just keep stepping forward. And it's encouraging to know that no matter how in tune with God you are, you will oftentimes find yourself perplexed by God's will. I mean, if the Apostle Paul didn't know what God was leading him, and he was this spiritual giant, that, that being spiritually connected to the Lord doesn't always mean that you're going to know God's will. Sometimes God has purposefully left you in the dark because he wants you to take one step in front of the other, not knowing where each step leads so that your dependence will increase. Have you ever had that happen in your life? God has kept you in the dark, and all you really know is the next step, the next step. Because once I get to Torah, God finally reveals it. He, he has a vision at night. And there's a man from Macedonia, which is Greece, which is getting into Europe, a whole new continent, a whole new area, a whole new place for for ministry and for evangelism. And the man says, come over to Macedonia and help us. Wonderful picture that God wants us involved in missions. He wants us to go where the gospel is not gone. Verse 10, and when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. You know, that's where, how God's will works. He may show you exactly what it is at a certain point, but you have to keep probing. You have to keep moving. You have to keep stepping forward in order to know what God's will is. God can't steer a truck that isn't going forward. Right? You can turn the steering wheel in a truck that's idle all you want. It's not going to turn anywhere. But a vehicle that's moving forward can be steered, and that's how God works. You've got to be moving forward. You've got to be serving him. You've got to be probing out his will, and then he will close doors and he will open doors, but you have to be making forward progression in his will to be able to discern what his will is.
And God sometimes wants us in the dark so that we'll depend on him. I close with this. You know, we sometimes want to see the end of God's plan, and he's more interested in showing us the next steps. There's a story about a boy named Jimmy who went and visited his grandparents who lived on a farm, and one night his grandmother asked him to go out to the barn and feed the cows. And Jimmy said, but Grandma, I can't see the barn. It's too dark. His grandmother stood on the porch and said, can you see the well? Jimmy said, yes, ma'am. He said, walk to the well. When he got to the well, she said, can you see the apple tree? Jimmy said, yes, ma'am. He said, well, then walk to the apple tree. Then she said, Jimmy, can you see the barn now? He said, yes, ma'am. And she said, then Jimmy, go feed the cow. That's the way God oftentimes reveals his will to us. So we have to be willing to take the next step, even if you can't see the final destination. So as we close, the perspective we have this morning is, is that God can use any crooked situation for his will. And will we have the perspective to be able to look for God's will in that? Or will we give up on God and say, God, you can't fix this? We have to believe that at the center of it all, that God will use you for his glory because he loves you, and he's given you grace, and he has a purpose for your life. Would you bow with me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you will use us, that you will guide us, that you will teach us your ways. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that we'd be willing and ready, that we would not be pessimistic about what seems like destructive situations, Lord, but we would be optimistic knowing that you, God, are not thwarted. Your will cannot be changed, but Lord, your will will be done above all. And we pray for that in your name. Amen. Oh, what a morning. We have the opportunity now to stand and sing together this song that we introduced during uh, our offering time. Surely goodness, surely mercy. And just that idea, the Lord is my shepherd. He's the one that will guide me. And then during the bridge, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. His will, not mine. Surely goodness, surely mercy. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In green pastures he makes me lie down. He restores my soul and leads me on for his name, for his great name. Surely goodness, surely mercy, Right beside me all my days, and I will dwell in your house forever, and bless your holy name. You prepare a table right before me. In the presence of my enemies Though the arrow flies And the terror of night is at my door I'll trust you, Lord Surely goodness, surely mercy Right beside me all my days, and I will dwell in your house forever, and bless your holy name. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will feel the shadow of death, you are on my side, and even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, and even though I walk through the valley of the 
shadow of death, and you are on my side. Surely goodness, surely mercy, right beside me all my the name and we get to sing together the names of our father abba father living water shepherd servant king master teacher lord keeper counselor prince of peace almighty creator emmanuel savior adonai and the rock and his name jesus abba father Living water, shepherd, servant, and king. Master, teacher, Lord, and keeper, counselor, prince of peace. Almighty creator, Emmanuel, Savior, song is called Sovereign Lord, and it's this beautiful picture of what our Savior did for us. The first part of each verse is Christ on the cross, and it's that idea that Pastor Brett shared from the Word. When we look and we think, how can this possibly be your will, God? Our Savior, is, it's a righteous life, but his flesh is torn, his hands are wounded, thorns on his brow, broken heart, enduring scorn. Is this the Sovereign Lord? And then we get to answer, destined for the highest place, this is the Sovereign Lord. His will be done.
Righteous life, flesh so torn, wounded hand, brow with thorn, broken heart, enduring scorn, is this the sovereign Lord? Borrowed tomb, empty space, takes our sin, leaves his grace, destined for the highest place, this is the sovereign Lord, Lord your greatness is unsearchable, and your kingdom is forever, you are near and you are wonderful, you are my sovereign Lord. Fallen heart, lifted eyes, stumbling words, longing sighs, trembling hands, embrace the skies, you are my sovereign Lord. Risen heart, joyful eyes, praises soar, my soul cries, song of life. That never died, you are my sovereign Lord. Lord, your greatness is unsearchable, and your kingdom lives forever. You are near and you are wonderful. You are my sovereign Lord. Lord, your greatness is unsearchable. And your kingdom lives forever. You are near and you are wonderful. You are my sovereign Lord. Risen heart, joyful eyes, praises soar. My soul flies, song of life that never dies you are my sovereign lord amen father thank you for your word thank you for the reminder that you are sovereign and father that we would step out in faith and in love for those around us that we would take your word that we would we would recognize we were not given a spirit of fear or timidity lord but that we would go and that you would direct our paths as we continue our day-to-day, -day, Father, and in Sunday school and, and time in the Word, Lord, we just pray that it would bring glory to your name, in your precious name. Amen. You are dismissed. Lord, your greatness is unsearchable, and your kingdom lives forever. You are near and you are wonderful. You are my sovereign Lord. Risen heart, joyful eyes, praises soar, my soul flies, song of life that never dies, you are my song.